So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first seminar in this year's Game Changer series. This is the third year we've held the Game Changer series, and we're really um, pleased to have our guest speaker, Councillor Krista Adams, come and speak to us today and her team. Um, Firstly, I'd just like on behalf of TRI to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on today, the Turrbal and Jagera people. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community and pay our deep respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. And also to welcome any First Nations people who are here in the audience or online today. So welcome everyone. Today's seminar um, is uh, by Brisbane's Deputy Mayor, Councillor Krista Adams. And she's gonna speak on an interesting topic, particularly in a research institute, but importantly based less than two kilometers from the Gabba and also less than three kilometers from the CBD, which is undergoing a huge transformation at the moment. Councillor Adams will speak on the topic, Brisbane 2032, alive with opportunity. She tells me she's going to leave plenty of opportunity and time for questions uh, and debate around the future of Brisbane. Krista Adams was elected as councillor for the ward of Wishart in 2008 and has held a variety of senior management roles. Since 2016, councillor Adams has represented the Holland Park ward and following the 2020 council election was reappointed as deputy mayor and chairs, oh, and, and she chairs the city planning and economic development committee. She's also been appointed as the civic cabinet chair for economic development. And she brings some of her team from BEDA, which you'll hear more about shortly. And she also for the Brisbane council uh, chairs the Brisbane 32, 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee. Today, Councillor Adams will tell us about what Brisbane will look like in 10 years time, and also the 10 years beyond that, and how we will ensure that the opportunities presented by the Olympic and Paralympic Games will deliver a lasting legacy for Brisbane and for generations to come. Councillor Adams will also talk about the changing Brisbane transport scene and how you'll get to work in the future and the development of the precinct such as the Bogo Road precinct, which we sit on and work that will be done in attracting and retaining the med tech industry in Brisbane. So welcome Councillor Adams. I should highlight in the tradition of many of our game changer uh, speakers, she's recovering from an injury, but uh, able to get up and down the stairs. Thank you, Scott. I did have a great break in Japan skiing in January, and I, I don't think I was the only one in Brisbane that did the same thing. Look, it's absolutely lovely to be with you here today in person and online. I'd like to start too by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet here this afternoon, or this, that's my day, this morning, uh, the Yagara and Turrbal people, those elders who are past, who are present, and particularly the emerging over the next couple of decades as well. Uh, it is a big role in Brisbane City Council in the next uh, 20 years to look at economic development and the Brisbane Olympic and, 20, uh, and Paralympic Games in 2032. And I suppose the first thing I want to start with is that I'm not on OCOG. Uh, the Lord Mayor has the pleasure of being on OCOG. There is also a thing called OKEG, which I'm not on OKEG as well. Um, just checking on the... We got there. Uh, however, uh, in council, we are very much like a uh, shrinky dink version of the state government, I like to ex explain it as. So we have civic cabinet roles and economic development and the Olympic and Paralympic Games have been put together by no accident. We know that the Olympic Games is four weeks of uh, sport in August, July, in July, August in 2032, and then the Paralympic Games a couple of months later. But that's not the advantage and the opportunity that we see. We see the 10 years beyond that. 
So my role in the next uh, few years at least is to make sure that we harness that opportunity that we have to make sure what we see in 10 years time and 10 years beyond is exactly what the people of Brisbane want to see, that we keep everything that we love. And what do we love? We love our enviable outdoor lifestyle possibly not so much today when it's 35 degrees and 110% uh, percent humidity at the end of March. But it will be lovely at Easter when we all go camping and I'm sure it'll be raining as well. Uh, but we do have an enviable outdoor lifestyle. We have a thriving arts community. We have some of the most amazing natural assets. And one of the things that really blew the Olympic Committee away when they finally got to come and visit us about six months after it announced as Olympic City is our natural assets, our green, our trees, our uh, water dragons at the lunch where they had at South Bank and the kangaroos hopping across the driving range, which we did explain to them that the kangaroos wouldn't be there when the people were shooting. The koalas they just saw in the trees when they went out to visit the Anamir's Velodrome, they really were blown away by the natural assets and the biodiversity we have in our city. We are the largest local government in Australia. Uh, we used to be third largest in the world, but a few amalgamations land-wise makes uh, LA and makes uh, Mount Isa larger. But when it comes to actual um, government and the government area that we look after, we're definitely the largest. Uh, we are the fastest growing capital in Australia, thank you to COVID, um, when everybody realised that Victoria and New South Wales are so not where you want to be if there's any opportunity of a lockdown again in the future. Uh, we've seen 100,000 Australians move to Brisbane over the past five years. And in the last 12 months, they've been coming at about 1,500 a week. And it is mainly interstate migration. Those that are travelling from overseas tend to be coming uh, to Sydney and Melbourne again. But I can assure you, it won't be very long before they realise they've made the mistake and they start moving to the place they should have gone in the first place, and that is Brisbane. Uh, we average 283 days of sunshine every year. And whenever I speak about that, particularly to our Asian communities, when I'm over in China or in uh, in Seoul, they're, they're lucky to see, you know, 35 days of blue sky, let alone um, sunshine as well. We are the largest carbon neutral government uh, in Australia and the first carbon neutral government and biggest organisation at the time 10 years ago. And we have a budget that we have just beaten Tasmania's state budget again of 3.9 billion. Oop, I've gone the wrong way. There we go. So this gives you a bit of an idea of why Melbourne and Sydney were so 50 years ago, as I like to say. Sorry if you're, you're watching online from Melbourne or Sydney or if you're here as an expat, but my understanding is if you're an expat and you now live in Brisbane, you are the ones that sell Brisbane the best because you can explain to everybody about why you are here and where the opportunities are. So we have a very uh, great opportunity with our efficiency of scale to make sure that we can plan really, really well um, for the Olympics and the 10 years beyond so we can absolutely uh, get the capacity for the housing that we need and enough housing to manage the affordability, but also keep those green spaces in between. When it comes to the Olympics, here gives you a bit of an idea around uh, where we are compared to some of uh, the past and uh, emerging uh, Olympic cities as well. Um, again, very large, London and, uh, and Sydney even, the Olympics weren't even in the city of London. Um, the Sydney Olympics weren't in the Sydney uh, city of Sydney. So the London Olympics were in um, Stratford and we know the Sydney Olympics were out in the Homebush area as well. Uh, Paris is a little bit more like us, but uh, obviously a denser population in their area. And LA, you've really amalgamated quite a few different governments there to that LA area, uh, but they are seen as one large local government as well. So we have got, as I said, quite a bit of advantage here um, with the size and uh, how we can plan for the future as well. Just a little bit of history, and I, I like to show this, and now I can see the faces. There's plenty of here that would probably, like myself, enjoyed Expo 88. Uh, and we like to say that the 2032 Olympics will be for the next generation what 88 was for my generation. Um, I was at uni in 1988, and I was just saying to Scott, my lecture rooms didn't look like this at UQ in 1988. But I'm glad to see that they still don't cater for a left-hander when you have to write your lecture notes as well. Some things never change. Um, we've seen a lot of urban renewal. Think about Tenerife. Think about the gas works over there. Think about 
what South Bank looked like in 1987 and what it looks like now, and that's taken a, quite a while. And then, of course, the uh, the game changer on July 21st, 2021, uh, of the host city announcement. That is when we really saw um, the opportunity of what we we're going forward as well. I think the most exciting thing to understand about the Olympics is we are now in a list of names that says Tokyo, Paris, LA, Brisbane. That's the order of the Olympic Games in the next 10 years. There's some uh, Winter Olympic Games in there as well, but that is the, the class of city that we are now mentioned. LA and Paris are coming before us. Tokyo, obviously a slightly different Olympics, um, but Paris, LA, Brisbane, very, very exciting. And we know on the night of the 21st of July, we had a 15,000% increase on the Google search for Brisbane, which meant the rest of the world was going, where the heck is Brisbane? But that's exactly what we want them to do. That is the opportunity that we now have from that one announcement nearly 600 days ago. I know we've got to get on with it. That one announcement is the thing that we need to now pick up and run with using a, an Olympic uh, analogy as well. So what does it mean? It means that we will have 3 billion people looking at Brisbane in July, late July. Yes, we're having the Summer Olympics in winter, but as we have just experiencing now in autumn, we know why. Uh, Three billion people will be, the art of the world will be watching Brisbane. And if they haven't already come to visit us and experience this before the Olympics, hopefully they'll come and visit us afterwards. It's an $8.1 billion economic impact for Queensland, 17.6 um, for Australia. But the jobs for Queensland is amazing. And of course, a lot of those jobs filter down into Brisbane. But that means we need to do a lot of planning because as we are hearing a lot now due to COVID, um, we just don't have those FTE. We don't have the labour force at the moment and do we have the skills that we need and how can we work on that talent attraction and take those opportunities as well. And this is where Brisbane steps in. We are very, very determined to make sure that we get the legacy of the Olympic Games right. And legacy is probably not the word that we want to speak about at the moment because it's not about just uh, what happens uh, from 2032 to 2042. It's about what happens leading up to the legacy, to the uh, games as well. And legacy has got a, a terminology of what happens after, but we're very, very interested to make sure we can see what can happen now. Um, we've been to Paris and have been seeing what they've been doing over the last four years leading into the Olympics. They've got endowment funds, they're out there, they're delivering for their sporting communities leading up to the Olympics. And we think that is very, very important. Um, the legacy is not stadiums. It's not stadiums for us. The legacy for us is active and healthy, clean and green, a labour force, a volunteer base. We need tens of thousands of volunteers as well. And we won't have an Olympic park. So this games precinct makes it, shows you a little bit about how the new norm, which I'll talk about, um, for the Olympics means that we don't have a highly curated stadia experience where you walk in, you buy your ticket, you walk through the gates and the athletics is over here and the, the swimming is over there and you can pop down there and see the basketball or the diving. We have the city as a venue. So if you went to the Sydney Olympics, you went out to Homebush and that's where most of the, the things happen. If you went to the London Olympic Village, you headed out to Stratford where they had the swimming and the athletics and everything in between. Um, it is now a fantastic urban renewal site and they we're taking some uh, learnings out of that as well. But it was a curated Olympic park. What we're seeing in Paris is the city as a venue. And you saw the photo before, the city of Paris. There's a lot happening in the city of Paris, but there's a lot that is happening in the greater city of Paris as well. So the Solideo who are delivering uh, the venues and the Athletes Village and everything like that in Paris, they're out in Saint Denis, um, they're out on the fringes of the Greater London, making sure that their areas that need the urban renewal are getting the games as well. And in Brisbane, it's the same. 54% uh, of the events are going to happen within the five kilometres of the CBD the inner city as we call it but there's not going to be a big fence that you pay for a ticket and you come into the inner city 5ks it is all going to be around 
um, that inner five Ks and how that inner five Ks then becomes walkable and subtropical and easy to move around, whether it's on uh, a scooter or a bike or you're walking or you have a wheelchair or it's on the Metro or the Cross River Rail. Moving around that inner five Ks is going to be absolutely vital. And that's where the role of the city uh, comes in to make sure we maintain that livability. A little bit about the new norm. Uh, and that's probably one of the hardest things to explain to the generation uh, uh, that my mother is in, is that you uh, you bid for the Olympics and then you go broke. You know, that is that is the common, the common argument we see from the older generation. Why would you do that? We can't even afford these things. You're going to send the city broke. Um, the new norm is very, very different. Whereas 15 years ago, you had to have new stadiums. Everything had to be new. It had to be just for the Olympics and the IOC wanted it all spick and span. They've realised that Sydney's are gonna, cities are going to stop bidding if they continue like that because there was the thing that the Olympics sends you broke. So we came and started speaking to the IO6 in, uh, IOC in 2015 from the Council of Mayors and said, have you thought about starting to look at cities that can do a regional approach and can start using venues that they already have because they're fit for purpose and they need anyway. And the IOC did embrace that, um, that new norm, thankfully. And we went into this very, very clear idea that what we wanted to see was transport infrastructure. The Council of Mayors were adamant, we need the transport infrastructure for our growing city. And that was eight years ago. That's even become more important now. Uh, and we're really pushing the transport infrastructure as one of our legacies and we need it before the games as well. But what you see here in the new norm is 18 out of the 32 competition venues are already there and they're um, for the Paralympic and the Olympic. There's more events in the Paralympic Games than there are in the Olympic Games, which is why they can't be held at the same time. And let's make it clear, Paralympic Australia don't want to be held at the same time. They see themselves at a very different event. So we talk about um, one Olympics, two events. So it's, it's a very exciting thing now with their, their parallel as well. 84% of the venues are existing or temporary uh, and 56% of the sports will be held within five kilometres of the CBD. So there's not a lot of new building. Uh, the Gabba obviously is well and truly a forefront of the mind if you're living in Brisbane at the moment. The Gabba need to be rede redeveloped anyway. So it's not being paid for by OCOG. It's not being paid for by the federal government. That is a state government uh, project that needed to be done. It needs to be done um, for the uh, games, but it needed to be done anyway. And it's a bit hard to explain because if you go to the Gabba and you watch the Lions or you watch the cricket, it's like the Gabba's great. It works fine. I don't understand why you need to knock it down. But if you've ever had the pleasure of working back of house or having to move around behind it, it is very, very, very in need of a refurbishment to make sure it can cater for what you need in today's uh, sporting venues. So here's a master plan of our Olympic site in Brisbane. It's the inner city. Um, so it gives you an idea if we start at the top left-hand corner and work, work, walk through it, um, you've got your horses there, that's in Victoria Park. So the blue are the existing facilities, upgrading the pink, the new ones, not many there in the yellow, and temporary in the green. So on the top left in the blue, the equestrian is at the RNA, the cross country at Victoria Park. Um, Victoria Park will also, um, uh, RNA will have the dressage and the arena um, horses. The uh, Victoria Park will also have the freestyle BMX. That'll be a fantastic view. If you can remember, I remember clearly, uh, the diving in Barcelona and they dived off there and you could see the Barcelona behind them. And Barcelona actually made their city the fourth biggest global tourism city in the world off the back of the Olympics in 92. No one wanted to go to Barcelona in the 80s. Uh, but now it is the fourth most visited capital city in the world. Uh, so that's what we're aiming for, a beautiful view over the back of Victoria Park straight into the city that tries to get everybody here to visit us. Um, the Athletes Village is up at Hamilton North Shore. Uh, we've got the golf at Royal Queensland, obviously. Ballymore will host the hockey. Indoor Sports Centre over at the Albion on the Racing Queensland site. So think basketball, volleyball, um, Paralympic sports uh, like wheelchair rugby, things like that will be over there. Then you come closer into the inner city, you've got Suncorp, Suncorp Stadium for the soccer and the rugby sevens. Uh, the Brisbane Arena, which has taken us three years to come back to the original idea over the main yards at the uh, Roma Street train station. It will have the swimming and the water polo, but as you see, it's a new facility, but it's a temporary for the pool. The pool will be a drop-in 
because we don't need another Olympic pool in Brisbane or the Gold Coast area, but we do need one that is within the CBD of the hosting city. Uh, and the pool will, it will then become a 10 to 15,000 seat arena, which we do need. If you had a look at the weekends where we just had uh, Ed Shearer and, and Sting and, and we need another arena so we can host those things as well. King George Square will be a life site. Cultural forecourt will be a life site. They have archery in the cultural forecourt. We have the International um, Broadcast Centre over there at South Bank as well in the Kurilpa Precinct. And then in the BCEC, badminton, taekwondo, wrestling, uh, archery. Uh, no, that's fencing. Uh, and then, of course, the Brisbane Cricket Ground, the Gabba, uh, where we'll have the athletics opening and closing ceremony. Still waiting to see how uh, Paris goes with their opening ceremony in the river because that's my personal push. Let's use the river for the opening ceremony. We'll see how that security goes. Uh, Brisbane's inner city. We are the gateway to the Asia Pacific region. So we need to make sure that we are keeping that lifestyle. We are growing our economy and we have this opportunity now with the Olympics and with the eyes of the world on us. We produce 50% of the uh, gross product here, gross regional product. Um, we are going to have an extra half, nearly half a million workers by 2041. Our economy is going to boom. We are going to have many, many more residents, which we are working on as well, but we need to keep the spaces in between the parts that we love. We need to keep those spaces in between. And as you can see with the Olympic venues, we need to make it really easy to move around as well. Our advantage is, and we do have that competitive advantage, we have the lifestyle and the amenity already. We do know what um, we want to see more of. We're modern, we're subtropical, and we've got an affordability advantage. Yes, it has gone up in the last two years. Uh, there has been a bit of a spike, but we are still very affordable compared to Sydney, Melbourne, and places overseas. Um, our governance... Uh, with a large city council, as I said, we have got the um, size efficiency, but even with the state government and the federal government, particularly with our city deals, we're all working very well together to make sure we get the best outcomes. We're a very social capital. We've got a, a strong skilled workforce, although we do need more at the moment now. And of course, we're here showing the example of our tertiary vocational and knowledge institutions in Brisbane are really stepping up uh, above Sydney and Melbourne and being recognised overseas, which I know Miriam and the team are going to talk more about our med tech um, work as well. Our infrastructure, our curfew free airport, which I think it will stay there as well. Our port of Brisbane, um, we are the closest capital city to Asia. And I think sometimes Asia forgets that and they really just woken up to that fact as well. So we have definitely got the opportunity for the airport and the port of Brisbane and those things to grow as well. But we do have a lot of specialisations, um, our logistics hubs, our economy, our resource sector. We are the largest mining city in Queensland, something we shouldn't forget. It is definitely very much the heart of what we do here. We're the white collar side of the resources industry, obviously, but that is a very, very large part of the wealth that we have in Queensland and the nation as well. Too far. And of course, something that is very important to uh, TRI and the Princess Alexandra Hospital and the work we're doing um, through Bogo Road and across to Herson is our knowledge and lifestyle corridors. So we did our knowledge corridor studies uh, just pre-COVID, I'm going to say 2019, we did the knowledge corridor work with the state government. It's on the Brisbane City Council website if you want to have a look um, more closely at it. But it covers the inner five Ks of the city. And as you can see, it's very clear that uh, large blue arrows through the middle um, where we are here through uh, Bogo Road, Wollongabba, City Centre, out to Hurston, um, St Lucia, just across the river on the other side. It really does bring together those tertiary and knowledge institutions within that inner 5K of where the hub is as well. Around that, we have growth precincts, and you can see the nodes there, to Wong, Milton, Fortitude Valley, uh, Breakfast Creek with the Albion Centre. And uh, obviously they're then overlaid now since 2021 with the games venue precincts. Uh, and we do know that people that are moving to the city and young people that were aspiring to their first probably unit nowadays in their house want to live where it's happening. And the inner 5K is where it's happening. And uh, we need to make sure that we cater for that as well. One of the things that we've been looking closely at with our industrial strategy uh, is our urban enterprise areas. And that is looking at 
where our industrial areas are at the moment um, that can be turned into great places to live, to work, to play, to have culture and make sure we can put the green back into that inner five Ks as well. So I mentioned it before, if you think back to uh, what we looked at for uh, Tenerife and uh, the Newstead area, if you're old enough, you may remember that it was an enormous bus depot, the Gasworks site and Breakfast Creek Road through there. It was the Gasworks is still standing there, but um, that was the Gasworks. And that was the fringes of the city in the day, a um, hundred years ago when we, we first settled in the 1860s. Uh, now, of course, it is as inner as you can get in our capital city. But those industrial sites are not what we want to necessarily see within the inner five Ks of the city. So we need to regenerate and look at different ways that we can use them, but we can use them to our advantage and take the opportunity. So the Tenerife and New Set is an opportunity that has been taken through the first round of urban renewal in the 1990s. South Bank, it was wharves. Um, it was, uh, if you look back at the photos of De Costello coming in from the marathon in the 1982 Commonwealth Games, it was grass and it was warehouses. And I can remember standing there and it was just what you were so used to. And you can't even imagine now when you look at South Bank. Um, just 10 years ago, Howard Smith Wharves, um, Heritage Wharves, that's where they came in and they did all their trading. That was the Port of Brisbane. And now look at that as a lifestyle precinct. Uh, and we have some of those great urban enterprise areas in the inner five Ks as well. Uh, think in the Kurilpa precinct, we've got Parmalat, Vizi. Um, so we've got milk factory, glass factory, concrete batching plant. That's one and a half Ks from the CBD. Obviously, Vizzy's already been bought out and we're starting to talk to Hanson and Parmalat and Lactalis about what the opportunities are um, that we could have in those precincts. South Bank 2.0. And then you have a look at your corridor out through Breakfast Creek out to Albion. Again, indoor sports centre out there. Industrial in that area. There's different industrials. There's different type of industrials now. Do we want to see um, paint strippers and panel beaters? Probably not. But we want to see med tech and we want to see uh, opportunities for research and development with our knowledge institutions, which is a type of industrial, but we can create some great places around those urban areas as well. And that leads us to what those future industries are. And I know the team, Miriam and Lisa here, are, are here from the Brisbane Economic Development Agency. And we've been working very hard on these future industries over the last probably five or six years. Uh, the food and agribusiness has been one that we've been doing for quite a while, helping our, our farmers out west get uh, the food to your plate, but also to export that food. We have got a fantastic salad bowl uh, just to the west of us, and we can have the opportunity to supply um, that food for the rest of the world. Uh, we have done property tech over the last two years, which has been extremely successful. And we have just uh, launched our med tech, uh, which I won't steal too much of the thunder, but we do know it is, uh, we've just had our first um, uh, med tech program go through and we've just launched our second one. Uh, but the economic impact for the health sector for us is 16.1 billion per annum. And there's a lot of jobs supported in that area. And you uh, would know that more than any of us in this room as well. We are really dedicated to supporting this sector. And we know with MedTech, there are so many branches uh, beyond uh, just the vaccines and everything that we've needed over the last 12 months, sports tech as we come into the Olympics, health tech as we're an aging community as well. Um, we do think that with the, the basis that uh, knowledge institutions like the PA, uh, the Mater Hospital, but UQ, Griffith and QUT are doing, there's some fantastic opportunities that we have in the Brisbane sector for that. So what are our next steps? Our next steps are to develop a strategy overall, um, an inner city strategy that takes all of those things into account. Uh, you may have seen in the media, we launched our housing, we um, presented our housing strategy in the last couple of weeks, our sustainable growth strategy on how we're going to manage the people that are coming into Brisbane at the moment. Our city plan currently already caters for the next seven or eight years for the, the growth that we're seeing, but we always keep it up to date for looking at the projections in the future. Um, we are going to be looking at what we can do in industrial areas in suburban um, areas as well. So uh, if you're on the south side, you'll know um, the Bone Mill Road down at Runcorn and the old factories down there. We've got Top Taste in Chermside, which is an old factory as well. And 
And even your Maruka Magic Mile or your Logan Road Magic Mile, which is in the middle of my ward, um, not many people actually walk from um, car yard to car yard to buy their cars anymore. So what are the opportunities uh, in those areas to see some housing and jobs and commercial areas? But my role in economic development and with the games is to harness the inner city, focus around the city um, as a venue in the five, uh, five Ks and create a program that has some short, medium and long-term strategies to make sure we see our walkable boulevards. We see those big shady trees. Uh, people need to, and I think Brisbaneites don't even realise that from the Gabba to the CBD is going to be less than a three kilometre walk once the Green Bridge is built at Kangaroo Point up through Main Street and over, you'll be landing at the Botanic Gardens in a less than 20 minute walk from the Gabba. And then of course, we need to go back the other way, um, down past the Marta through Stanley Street to connect to South Bank as well. Again, as a local Brisbane mind who's grown up here, you think, oh, I wouldn't even think of that walk. We need to make it more attractive so people do think of that walk. We're, at, except for maybe Spring Hill area, we're a pretty flat city when it's around the river. We need to make it more attractive um, for people to be able to uh, walk and be able to access that, as I said, on scooters or wheelchairs or prams and anything in between as well. So it's a very, very exciting time. Um, I'm glad I could uh, share some of the enthusiasm that I have for what my role will be in the next couple of years and give you uh, a bit of an idea of what we're doing, if we're not on OCOG, what are you doing in the Olympic space? That's what's going to keep us very, very busy. I would love to hear any feedback and happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Christopher, um, for a great uh, sharing your enthusiasm and the, um, the vision of the council. We've now got an opportunity to have some questions. And uh, if you're online, please share those questions. So perhaps um, I can kick off. Um, can you share with us some of the challenges of planning the fastest growing capital city, particularly being on a floodplain and talking about some of the housing issues moving forward? Yes, well, Brisbane is built on a floodplain and uh, unfortunately we can't just pick it up and pop it up onto a mountain somewhere. We need to deal with it. Uh, we're on the bend of the river, hence why the port was actually up here in South Brisbane and uh, Howard Smith Wharves. And 60% of the CBD does actually flood. So we have been working very hard specifically since 2011 to make sure we can address the resilience of our flooding areas in Brisbane. Uh, because we don't need people to move out of the inner 5Ks, but we need to make sure that people are ready uh, for an incident. Probably one of the things that uh, does keep us awake at night <laughs> is in 2032, we could have the biggest flooding event that we've ever seen in February, six months out, or we could be in the second millennial drought. So we're needing to make sure that we have got the resilience right, that if it is the flood, we know exactly what we're doing. And I mean, I suppose if you just look at what happened last year, Last year's event uh, in February was much bigger than what we saw in 2011 and where it took us um, four years to get our city cats back up in the water after 2011, it only took us seven months to get them back up in the water after 2011. So we're getting better. Our infrastructure as it's rebuilt is rebuilt to a standard that it's resilient. Our houses, we have made changes to allow them to get up and we've reminded people not to build under if you're in one of some of those very um, heavily uh, uh, higher levels if you're near the river. But we're also talking to people about just making sure that if you are going to build underneath, you're using flood resilient material. And there's nothing that better example than when I was in Milton after the event last year in February and beautiful little um, 1890s cottages that you have around Milton State School. You can see the house that took the opportunity to lift after 2011 build in with their blue board, not use MDF, um, make sure that it was all um, honed concrete underneath. They were hosing it out. Yeah, they still had some stuff that they needed to chuck, got a bit muddy. But then the little 1890s that didn't change and it was up to the rooftop again. So we need to think about how we plan for the future to make sure we take the opportunities to know what we know now and make sure we're, that we're resilient. Uh, on this other side of the banks of the river at the South Bank, we have definitely made sure that with any of our higher rise residentials that none of the electricals are down in the basement. 
That's a bit hard with your lifts if you're going to be a high story and lifts can be out of action as well. But as long as the power's not out, if it's just the electrical cabling for the lifts, so there's plenty of stairs that people can get up and down as they are. And we're working very closely with Energex because one of our tricks is the transformers in Energex. Uh, they turn it off because the transformer get flooded, but it, it affects such a large area that people that weren't even flooded and didn't have any issues don't have power for four days, which is as bad in a Brisbane weather like this than actually getting flooded. So we're working with a lot of our utilities and well as well around resilience making sure we can do the best we absolutely do. We cannot predict when the next flood is going to be, but there will be another flood and we need people to be able to recover as fast as they possibly can as well. Uh, but for a growing city, we're needing to make sure that we are going up, not out, that we are building homes where the infrastructure is and we're protecting our green space. We are 38% green in Brisbane at the moment in our local government area. 38% of our local government area is green space. Our aim is 45. We're still working on it. But just because we're putting more housing in, and particularly in that Karilpa precinct we've been talking about, doesn't mean we need to lose the green spaces. The spaces in between will be very, very important. And we do have the opportunity of a beautiful subtropical lifestyle that sometimes shade is really, really nice in Brisbane. Uh, and if you look at the, the developments like Fish Lane underneath the train tracks down there at South Brisbane with our rainforest that's down there, I mean, green doesn't mean it has to be a park. There's definitely ways and green buildings and subtropical design that we can make it a very green and inviting city, uh, but still manage the growth as well. So we have one question up the back, but before that, we have a question um, from Vanessa. And I guess you've talked a bit about the housing sustainability and a bit about the green space. Can you talk uh, a little bit more about the council's approach to sustainability? So sustainability in general, I mentioned uh, the uh, the carbon neutrality, and that's something that we're very early adopters on. And we have a very large program in council about keeping clean and green. Some of it is very small uh, at a household level. We've got kitchen caddies. We encourage people to compost. We introduced the green waste bin so you could put your green leaf in, um, uh, litter in there. We are trying to minimise landfill. We have curbside collections. We have recycling stations. We were also looking at a much larger level, and I'm I'm sure most of you will have heard about Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, uh, very much front and former, uh, foremost in the minds of uh, the UN, uh, of the uh, IOC, and definitely in Brisbane as well. So the Lord Mayor uh, went over to COP27 uh, in Egypt at the end of last year, and we have been signaled as the next uh, SDG city, and we're working through that certification at the moment, but it's a whole of council approach to our sustainable goals. So in planning, absolutely, green buildings, subtropical design, spaces in between, um, but there's also carbon sequestration and how we're dealing with that. We're working through that. We have signed on to be a carbon neutral um, games, the first games to be signed on for it. Paris is going to be doing the best they can. LA will probably do it, but they're not signed up to a contract. We have to do it. So we really have to think about how that is delivered as well. We've got the metro, which is electric. We're looking at how our buses can be electric. We're definitely looking at our lighting. Every little bit that you can think about that goes to lessen our carbon footprint, lessen our impact um, on the surrounding areas. Every bit of council is doing it. Transport, parks, planning, and of course, our, um, our waste economy as well. So it's a very much a whole of council approach. And again, there's so much I could talk about and I probably haven't even touched on a third of it, but please Brisbane City Council website has a lot of information around that too. And you can really drill down into some of the programs we're running. Question up the back. And one down the front after that. Please. Hey there, thanks for that talk. Um, Two questions. How many athletes are you expecting to come through the city when the event is on and support staff? And I suppose the second arm of that would be um, with something like the Olympic Village. Um, how are you thinking about repurposing that after the event? Yeah. Thanks. So I did actually have those uh, athlete numbers on me this morning, but I don't have them now. I think it's about 20,000 athletes between the Olympics and the and the Paralympics. Uh, and then you, of course, have all the 
the countries and the staff that go with that. And then probably more for the Paralympics with their coaching and their support staff as well. Uh, so there is quite a few, and that's something that we are working through, uh, particularly in the hotel space. So we did an incentive for hotels uh time flies when you're having fun, probably 10 years ago now. And that incentive was an infrastructure incentive to get five-star hotels. And we got 17, I think we're up to 18 new hotels in the last 10 years in Brisbane. And that's the type of forward, forward thinking that Graham Quirk had, like if we're going to have the Olympics, we're going to have somewhere for them to stay. Um, and it's the same for Kingsford Smith Drive. It's now you're driving and it was very painful. I admit it was extremely painful during the construction phase, but now it's there. It's a beautiful entry statement. But we could not have had North Shore Hamilton as the athlete's village without Kingsford Smith Drive so that you could move quickly through to the Olympic venues for the athletes. So the, the athlete's village, Hamilton North Shore, uh, is being managed through a priority development area through the state government. There is many, many apartments up there already and there's more coming, uh, but it will go back into the open market. So it's very much a part of the housing plan, a bit like the Commonwealth Games did for um, uh, the Gold Coast down around that hospital precinct as well. And there will be a mix through there of um, on general market apartments, affordable housing, public housing, uh, very much a mixed um, housing uh, development, but it will go back into the market after 2032. My head, Andy, at the front, please. Mm. To get the Olympics run. And the universities in these places are a great source of bright, young, active people. Um, so what do you see, what do you want everybody to do? Like, what, what, what chores do you want to give us all? Miriam would love to answer that question because she met with all the universities last week. Um, talent attraction is very much a big part of what the beta team are looking at in our growth trade and industry team. Uh, it's very easy to sell the Brisbane message now and we've got the students coming back as well. But we want to work really closely with the universities and the knowledge institutions about how we uh, retain that talent how we can get them work experience, how we can show them the opportunities they have and where those industries are. And as I said, Miriam can probably, when she's speaking after this, she can probably talk to it, but we've met with the universities and we're talking about what study Brisbane looks like, um, how we get that up and going again to attract the international students to come back to Brisbane, but even working um, smarter about how we get them to then stay in Brisbane. So there's a lot of levers that council doesn't have to pull around visas and, and all of that with the federal government. But I think the federal government does realise that we are going to need the workforce here. And as I said, the volunteers as well. So it's a very early stage conversation, but we are very keen to speak more to the universities about that. Do you want to yell something to me, Miriam, about that? So with our, um, our business growth progress, like the med tech that I mentioned and our property tech, we are partnering with the universities as well. So I really do encourage universities and the knowledge institutions or any of you to become engaged with the business hub because it's not just about people that are starting a business. It's definitely what we're there for to help our small to medium enterprises, which are 92% of our businesses in Brisbane. But it's also there for our institutions, our established companies to come in and help us support our fantastic vision that we have for the next um, few years as well. So if you're involved in that space, please speak to Miriam and the team at the hub. Come here, Gandhi. Just behind you, as I said. And then one more, so two more questions, one from here and one from Dee. Thank you. That was a, a great talk. You you talked about our marvellous knowledge corridor, and you also talked about how a lot of people are moving from interstate to Brisbane. So most of the Australian MedTech Centre is actually centred around Sydney and in particular Melbourne. So what are your specific strategies to try and attract med tech to Brisbane. Okay, so I'm probably going to steal some of um, some of Miriam's thunder here. So we started with the med tech program last year, and I'm just going to find my notes on this because I didn't actually say that. And I've got one of our very successful people here as well. So we have been um, working with those who wanted to start promoting their new um, med tech ideas as well with the program. And we have brought together in this first process, we brought together 10 MedTech 
um, businesses who really we saw had the ability to build their capability and could attract funding and actually promote what we're doing here in Brisbane as well. And in January, we took, uh, I'm going to say 10 of those medtech businesses over to San Francisco um, to the J, uh, JP Morgan um, pitch conference. And we are just trying to get the name out there around the world that Brisbane is the place that you come to for medtech. Sydney and Melbourne, so 50 years ago, come to where we're hosting the Olympics in 10 years' time. Uh, and what we've seen out of that, well, not only, and I'm sure Miriam's going to talk about, not only did they have a huge success in San Francisco and fun times, what I've seen from the um, uh, from the photos as well, but they got to pitch their innovation and their tech to 50 of the biggest um, angel investors uh, in the med tech space. But through that program, people got to vote for the best pitch of all of the pictures that they saw during the day. And Brisbane won gold and silver and highly commended. So can I just congratulate, because I know she's sitting here in the, uh, the audience, we had field orthopedics, Max Kelson and um, microbio and Erin's here as well. I don't what did you get Erin? Did you get, got the highly commended. I understand that we were supposed to get second, but they couldn't give Brisbane first, second and third. So they gave somebody in Japan second. So it didn't look like it was rigged. Um, but that's the type of level we're at. And when they were over there, and I'm sorry, Miriam, I'm stealing your thunder, they were just like, oh, wow, we didn't realise. They kind of knew in America that Vaxxis, they kind of knew Vaxxis and they knew that, and that's been a great stepping stone for people to realise, oh, yes, there is some great opportunity there. But all these other ideas of being able to do microsurgery in Brisbane on a patient in Longreach, it's just mind-blowing. And coming out of what they all see as a small country town in Brisbane, we just need to get our name out there. We need to sell our, our benefits from the rooftops. And that's where we started small. And we're hoping we can continue that um, through many of these programs in the years to come. But Miriam will talk more about that as well. So one, one quick question and brief answer, um, Dee. Uh, I hope this is a brief question. Um, I'm very excited as a resident living in Wollongabba, so, so happy with all the- Oh, yes, excited. you would be very happy living in Wollongabba, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but my question probably a little bit dark um, because we are uh, scientists, when we write in ground, we always have a session talking about the uh, risk mitigation. So uh, we have learned from um, Tokyo Olympics is because they have to hold these Olympics within the um, pandemic. So have you, the council, considered any risk mitigation strategy if there is economic or political any crisis during that. I know it's a very dark, but we always expect for the best, but also prepare for the worst. There, yes, you're right. There is absolutely a plan for the worst situation. And that will a lot be driven by OCOG. And I think, I don't think anyone would have even predicted in 2018 that a global pandemic could have been a risk to an Olympics. That was just totally unforeseen. But as I mentioned before, for Brisbane, it could be the biggest flooding event you know, six months out, or it could be a drought that we've had for five years and our water supplies are low. So we are definitely thinking ahead for those type of mitigations. I'm sure global pandemic is now on um, the front and up high in the top five of risk mitigation you've got to look at. Uh, but the other one is security. And we're very lucky here in uh, in Australia, we had the G20 in 2014, one of the most successful, uh, because we don't have that security risk that they have, like just even in Paris for people crossing borders very easily as well. So all of that is managed by OCOG, but we will have to do a lot of security as the city as well. So, I mean, there will be just to the most minor things I am imagining within the inner five city and five Ks of the city, you will find very few rubbish bins during the Olympics period. Now, if you go to Tokyo, there's no rubbish bins anyway. Um, I'm presuming they took them out for the Olympics, but I have a feeling they didn't have them beforehand because everybody's so obedient and they're so tidy. It's beautiful. But little things like that, where's the rubbish bins? Well, if you go to London, you'll see it. The rubbish bins are clear plastic bags that hang off a hoop. And that came from the Olympics. So you can see through the bins. So there's minute risk mitigations and there's large mitigations and they will absolutely thoroughly be looked at as well. I hope that was brief enough, please. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. And, um, we're going to have a, a brief um, uh, review by the beta team, but before we do that, let's take the opportunity and join me in thanking Krista Adams from 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next note, Orwell. We now have Miriam Kent. Um, whoops, I think I probably put something on the lectern there. I shouldn't have. Um, Miriam is the general manager of the business growth, trade, talent, and Brisbane Business Hub for the Brisbane Economic Development Agency. I should have practiced that, shouldn't I? She's going to tell us a bit more about the Accelerator Program. So welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, both the Agora people and the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge Councillor Krista Adams, our Deputy Mayor, who you just heard um, really share the excitement for the future in our city. So Brisbane, sorry, I just get the clicker right. Um, I'm part of the team in Brisbane Economic Development Agency. We basically um, play a critical role for the city's economic growth. Uh, our opportunity is to create growth and trade um, opportunities for local Brisbane businesses. BETA does deliver business growth initiatives. You heard the Deputy Mayor talk a bit about our MedTech. Our core focus of that is to support local priority sectors to scale globally. Um, we, we know here today that we are absolutely recognizing the local talent in medical um, innovation. And that is a huge opportunity for our city's uh, economic growth. The question earlier about the med techs, you know, 18 months ago, we started a program where we were really researching what was happening in the city. And we quickly identified 100 med tech companies here in the city who have the opportunity and are actually propelling our city um, globally on the map. We know that this is significantly underpinned by our state-of-the-art institutes, hospitals, um, and universities. And if you looked at the deputy mayor figures, there's something like 14 in our city. Um, this kind of innovation and the growth that we're doing is a huge shot in the arm and something we should be incredibly proud of. In terms of the uh, economy, you heard the deputy mayor talk about 16.1 billion for the health uh, economy here in our city and 161,000 jobs, which is just fantastic. All the um, indicators are positive for us. We're absolutely seeing immense infrastructure investment. You're about to have your own significant one here at Tri. We're also obviously got the long road into the Olympics and Paralympics and what that the game changer that makes for our city. That's why in 2022, we launched the city's first uh, ever MedTech Global Accelerator Initiative. We really wanted to champion this innovation and actually it was developed by industry for industry. You told us what you needed. You told us you needed access to the global markets. You told us you needed to be um, connected with those investors. And you also told us amplify our story. And we did this. We took the opportunity to shine, shine the light on the talent that is here in our city. Um, we provided a fast track to market, a fast track to investors through partnering with Life Science Nation a global player, player, which culminated at the Resi Conference in San Francisco in January at JP Morgan Health Week. I'll just quickly um, just give, give um, uh, credence and credibility to the groups that were with us. Microbio, one of your own home, um, home talent here at Try, and we've got Aaron with us today. Um, it really was the launch year where we backed local to go global. We absolutely wanted to accelerate the successes that each of these companies are already um, significantly achieving. It was about early supporting early stage ventures to connect with those partners for investment, collaboration, and distribution deals. Here we are at JP Morgan Health Week. Um, it was a, an incredibly successful opportunity. Uh, it, you can see the companies that I've previously mentioned, and as the deputy mayor says, three of ours took out sort of top prizes, which was incredible. And I think one of the biggest learnings going into it, sometimes when you're geographically positioned in this side of the world and probably not as connected with the rest of that talent and innovation, you actually walk into those uh, conferences and those uh, pitches feeling, where do we stack up? What was incredible was every investor that they met and pitched to talked about 
the product efficacy, the talent, and the credibility of the work coming out, not just out of Brisbane, but out of Australia. So I think sometimes we need to remember that and really back ourselves and know that we are absolutely not trying to get on the global stage for innovation, but we're actually there. It's about sharing it, telling our story and backing ourselves. And as the deputy mayor said, 50 international businesses took part in this challenge. But now there's an opportunity to go to the next year and join our 2024 program. So really, I just wanted to open the floor to that and say there is an absolute opportunity right now to apply and come on board with us. We will take early, early stage ventures, um, which will open those international markets and pathways. Each module is real world ex exercises and training. It really is to support you um, for your success in your global fundraising campaign. Uh, there is two, 10, uh, 10, there is, sorry, it will involve 10 two hour virtual modules, which will really give you that understanding of the competitive global uh, landscape and really help you prepare your pitch and get yourself ready for that market investment. The Global Investor Pitch Readiness and Shark Tank, which you saw in the earlier photos, was a one day intensive session with global partners. And we executed that at JP Morgan Health Week. That was incredible because you had um, Medtronics and really leading uh, JP Johnson and Johnson in the room, giving feedback and support to local businesses who were about to go into the real pitch the day after. BIDA also provide a three-year aftercare program. So some of the things now that we're looking at with those business, what is your next 18 months plan? How can we support you? What does that look like? So it's not just a shot in the arm. We do these accelerator programs. It's actually about a long-term relationship. Some of the successes to date have been execution for those companies that attended. They've actually got live strategic partnerships happening now. They've got funding commitment to capital raise, and they've got invitations to tender for global contracts. And we even know that, um, and Aaron's here to talk a little bit more, but we've even had investors come to Brisbane because they were so excited for what they heard um, since, since we were there in January. So this, just to give you the key dates, we're open now. Applications will close on the 17th of April. We'll announce our year two cohort in June, and we will start August to November, and then of course back to um, back to San Fran in January 2024. As I said, we've partnered with Life Science Nation. They have got a strong track record for linking medical pro products to capital um, investment. So uh, it's it's just a great opportunity, and I, I think that's really all I need to say. I'm open to questions, but I also know we're going to hear from Erin, who's going to give a little bit of an overview from a microbiome perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, look, it's my absolute pleasure to be here today to represent Microbio. Um, Dr. Flavia Huggins would normally be here, but she's unwell, so I'm stepping in. I'm sure many of you have come across Flavia, um, but just to give you a little background, we are Microbio, not to be confused with our lovely neighbour Microba, also here at TRI. Microbio is developing and commercialising Infect ID bloodstream infection, which is a pathogen detection test that can detect the 26 most common sepsis causing pathogens direct from whole blood in about three hours. Um, at the moment, we are 100% investor funded. Um, and as many of you know, commercializing a product takes a vast amount of money and seeking investment is a very uh, specialized skill, which many of you who I'm assuming are sort of coming from an academic background, may not have. Um, I expect because you're, many of you are from an academic background, you are used to writing grants and things like that. And you appreciate that there's a very particular style, a very particular method of communicating in grants. It's exactly the same when you're um, communicating to potential investors, uh, which is why having the opportunity to be part of something like this MedTech Accelerator program is an absolute game changer. I guess 
for us, there was kind of three key things that we really gained from being part of the MedTech Accelerator Program. Coaching, confidence and connection. So the coaching element was access to really excellent investment focused advisors, which is that Life Sciences Nation company. Um, for us to access them individually would have been prohibitively expensive for a company that is investor um, funded. And so to have the opportunity to access their knowledge to help us to craft and then refine our investment and investor materials was priceless. Um, talking to investors is a very specialised, uh, there's a very specialised way of talking to investors and it's even more specialised when it comes to an American or a US based audience. So having this advice was absolutely invaluable. Um, the second element, the, the confidence, when we got to JP Morgan Health Week and the Resi Conference, just to give you a bit of background, JP Morgan is an investment focused week of activities originally uh, hosted by JP Morgan, but has since sort of spawned this whole satellite um, city almost of events that take place in San Francisco in the in the first week of, of January. As part of that, there is this Resi conference, which is rethinking early stage investment. So it is specifically to connect early stage companies with investors who invest in early stage companies. Um, the Shark Tank session that we had was just a wonderful safe space for us to practice and refine our pitch with real investors who gave you know, excellent feedback on how we can describe our product and pitch specifically to investors. In addition, it was actually really wonderful for us to be exposed to a lot of other early stage companies. It really gave us confidence um, that we had some commercial strengths uh, and you know, helped us to really talk about our product and our journey and where we and our goals, where we intend to go with real confidence. And that, again, I feel like is a really, you know, it's a really priceless thing to walk away with. And then the third element is connections. Um, obviously, when we were there at Resi, we had the opportunity to do live pitching with investors. We had access to a large number of early stage investors who were actively looking for companies to invest in. And that is an opportunity that unfortunately we just don't get here in Brisbane. So it's it was an amazing opportunity. Secondly, we took advantage of organizing one-on-one -on -one meetings with some of those investors. So prior to actually attending Resi, you get access to a database of the investors that, go, that are going to be there. And you can identify all of the investors that match up with your product, your, you know, your growth patterns, um, and it allows you to uh, identify strategically valuable connections and you can set up one-on-one -on -one, one meetings with them. The third element is, again, because JP Morgan Week is this whole week-long critical mass of events, we were able to take advantage of other opportunities. So BEDA introduced us to uh, companies and, and other um, governmental agencies like Trade and Investment Queensland, Oz Industry. And so we were able to take advantage of invitations to roundtables, which allowed us to build even, up, even more connections, uh, which was a, that was a, a fantastic um, opportunity. And then fourthly, the trip to San Francisco really allowed us to consolidate the connections with the other Brisbane companies that we had made throughout the, the, the 10 weeks of preparation. Um, and it was a cracking good time. I mean, the BEDA did a beautiful job of carefully curating the group that was there. The people that were there were so inspiring. They were amazing human beings. And we had uh, just a fantastic fun time really um, celebrating each other's successes and really helping to build each other up. And I think that's probably one of the, the key takeaways that I would love to communicate to you is that, you know, when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. 
And so taking advantage of opportunities like the MedTech Accelerator is, you know, just another example of how BEDA and uh, companies and the governmental agencies are really helping to build that environment for success. So if any of you are eligible and thinking about applying for the Accelerator program, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Please get your applications in. We're way over time. It's great to see the audience by and large stayed for the whole time and great to hear the information about the Beta MedTech program, both from the organizers, but also the, the recipients or the successful recipients. Um, if you've got specific questions for the BEDA team, um, they will be here for a short period and also we've got uh, access to them, so let us know. And please take the opportunity of, again, thanking Councillor Adams, Miriam Kent and Erin uh, Myers for giving us a really uh, great uh, uh, future of Brisbane. Thank you very much. Our next game changer will be uh, by a Nobel laureate, Peter Doherty, on the 16th of May. More information to follow. Thank you. <laughs>